Good morning, beloved. Good to see everybody. We're going to start in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. This is the conclusion of our series that, of the book, uh, the epistle of 1 Peter. And um, Lord, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your goodness, your kindness, all the wonderful things you do for us. Please help us to understand uh, what is before us today. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 5 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 1 Therefore I exhort the elders among you as a fellow as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed The first word of this uh, verse is the word therefore and because the therefore is there, we ask why, and it kind of catapults us back to the previous chapter, which we looked at last week in verse 19. Therefore, according to, therefore, those also who suffered according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to the faithful Creator in doing what is right. This um, subject matter of suffering is something that is uh, very uh, dominant in this epistle. It's talked about a lot. And leading into this, this chapter now that's talking about the elders and what they're supposed to be doing in relationship to those of us in the, in the fellowship, it's in the context of suffering and dealing with suffering. If you go to chapter 1 again, please, um, where we began so many weeks ago, in verse 1, we see that the epistle was first, who it was first addressed to. Obviously, the epistle is, it relates to all Christians of all time, but it was first sent to, um, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pont Pontus, and Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia. These are people who were from Israel more than likely, who be, probably because of the persecution had to leave Israel and then they went into what we now know to be Turkey. They moved to a whole new area. It's a whole new culture. It's a whole new way of life. And it was difficult for them. It wasn't easy. It says in verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. They were having a difficult time, and they were suffering. And so again, a lot of what's written in the epistle, it relates to the subject matter of suffering. In verse 10 of chapter 1, it talks about it again. As to the salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know the person or the time of the Spirit of Christ within them, was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that followed. Here, uh, again, we're, we're brought back to Christ, to the sufferings that he endured, and to the glories that followed. The glory is he got raised from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and he's coming back as king of kings to bring God's kingdom with him. And then we see, as is up here on the screen, that in chapter 2, verse 19 through 23, Jesus sets a great example of how to suffer rightly. He is the example that we follow. How did he do it? How did he get through his horrific time and not sin so that we can follow his lead? And then in chapter 3, in verse 14 through 17, we are blessed when we suffer for the sake of righteousness. It talks in that, in that particular section that you can suffer for doing wrong or you can suffer for doing right. Suffering is not really optional. Everybody suffers. It doesn't matter if you're a saint or if you're a sinner. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world where Satan is the god of this age. We have to contend with. We're going to see in chapter 5. I think it's in verse 8 that he is an adversary, like a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. We have to contend with that. As Christians, we have to contend with the fact that we have the old nature that's still with us. 
If you're not a Christian, you just have that nature. You're really in trouble. But as a Christian, we have the new nature and we have the old nature. And there's this constant conflict that goes on. And that, that causes suffering. As Sean pointed out to us last week, having to contend with the temptation to sin all the time uh, is, is a point of suffering at times we have to deal with. So it's not, if you've got people in your life or in your own life, you have to deal with sickness at times. And uh, that, there's a degree of suffering that goes along with that. Or if you, have, if you uh, have people in your life, people that you love, they go through difficult times, that causes you to suffer. If they die, it really causes you to suffer a lot. So the point is, suffering's not optional. What is optional is how you respond to the suffering. That is optional. And that's why this epistle, a big part of why this epistle was written, is so that we can understand how to deal with suffering when it comes our way. Acting like there is no suffering is foolish. Sticking your head in the sand and saying, as a Christian, I don't have to suffer. I just have the abundant life. I'm never going to have any troubles. Well, you're gonna, that's a, a great deception, and that's not true. It won't take long to figure that out. So... Um, I don't, I don't think Jesus was cold cocked by his suffering. What I mean by that, that means a, a sucker punched or, you know, he, he wasn't surprised. He, he knew from the Old Testament the suffering that he was going to endure. And in preparation for that time, he spent at least three hours in prayer. He went into the Garden of Gethsemane over and over again, asking God, if I can not have this suffering, I would really prefer that. But if not, help me to do your will. And then what did God do? He sent an angel to minister to him so that he could endure the suffering without sinning. And in like manner, we want to emulate Jesus. We want to do the same. We want to seek God's help when we're facing suffering. Because the, re the reality of it is, is that, that suffering can either be the thing that breaks you or it can be the thing that makes you. You have to decide. You have that option. Suffering causes many people to get angry at God, to get mad at God, to turn away from God, to give up on God. And then for many, or for a few, it, it causes us to get strengthened in our relationship with God. Because in our time of suffering, we seek our God, and whenever you seek Him, as we heard earlier, you will find Him. Those who seek will find Him. And, and in doing that, it strengthens our relationship. It reinforces to us how much God loves us. Knowing that God loves us because he's there to help us and that we love him, it really does strengthen us. If you don't have adversity in your life, you don't really have opportunity to grow and to mature and to develop. And uh, the good news is we've got plenty of, of uh, opportunity to grow. <laughs> so, um, and then in chapter 4, verse 1, as we looked at last week, um, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And we looked at all those different sins and how that is a challenge for us. But we want to follow Christ's lead and endure well in our suffering. Then we come to chapter 5. Verse 1, therefore, in light of this suffering and the other things that are written in this epistle, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow el elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Let me just interlude here that what we see in Christ, we saw it in chapter 1, now you're seeing it here again in chapter 4, the sufferings, and then the followed by the glory. And that's it with us also. If we endure rightly with suffering, we will have immediate glory and ultimate glory when the kingdom comes. We will be rewarded for suffering rightly in the kingdom that's coming. Now going back to chapter 2, talking to the elders, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Because the church, the people of God, suffer, 
the exhortation to the elders is shepherd them. Take oversight because this is going to happen and you need to be there to help God's people in their time of need. So elders shepherd the flock of God. That shepherding the flock would have a lot more meaning to us if we didn't live in the capital district of New York because we don't see too many sheep running around here. Now, Donald, you, I saw a lot of sheep in Scotland, right? Um, I do remember that. I have vivid memories of the sheep, real sheep, <laughs> not metaphoric sheep. And so, um, but nonetheless, the scriptures are loaded with information about shepherding. Of course, in the, in the book of Psalms, one of the, one of the most popular Psalms of all is it talks about God as being our shepherd metaphorically, obviously how he takes care of us. Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. In other words, he makes provisions for my physical needs. He restores my soul when I'm hurt. He helps me. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He leads me where I need to go in my life. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though I'm suffering, I fear no evil. For you are with me, you are you're my rod and my staff, and they comfort me. Even through the battles of life, he's there to help us to be victorious. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness we always think of the word mercy because of the song, right? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. So that's what the shepherd does for his people. And David, who wrote that psalm and wrote so many of the other psalms that are in the book, uh, really understood this because he himself was a shepherd. And you remember the, the confrontation that he had with Goliath he had to convince Saul to let him go fight the giant. And here's what he said to him. But David said to Saul, your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. I went out after him and attacked him and rescued him from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. What? I mean, a lion or a bear came in and took one of the lambs. David attacked that animal, grabbed it by the beard, and got the... <laughs> Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, Yahweh, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, yeah, man, go. Take care. You know, <laughs> Yahweh be with you. <laughs> David shepherded literally a flock of sheep, and he understood how to take care of the people of God consequently. He knew that the, the literal sheep would be attacked, and when they were attacked, he went and protected them. In the same fashion, that's what a pastor or an elder is supposed to do with the family of God. When they are attacked by, and, and you know, the, the scriptures talk about what's going to say in, in, in Peter 5 here, as a roaring lion walk is about, walks about seeking whom he, and in Acts chapter 20, it talks about ravenous wolves. And, you know, they're so, the, the correlation is, is most definitely there. As a matter of fact, in, in Acts chapter 2, the Apostle Paul talks about the shepherding also. Look at this. For, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard. I, I should tell you who he's talking to. He is with the elders at Ephesus. This is Paul. He's, he's gone to Ephesus. He knows it's his last time there. He's called out the people who are the home fellowship coordinators, the elders, 
And here's what he says to him. I didn't hold back anything from you. Verse 28, be on guard of your, for yourselves and for the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. You have those both concepts, the shepherd and the overseer, to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on alert. Look, you elders, here's what's going to happen. There are going to be people that come in as wolves and specifically talking about the gospel to, to ravage the truth. And indeed, that has happened over the centuries with Christianity, where the truth has been ripped away from the people of God because the elders didn't oversee it as they should have. And that is the responsibility of an elder, not only to, to take care of the people when they're hurting, but to guard the fellowship so that we continue to maintain the accuracy and the, the, the greatness, the integrity of God's Word, because it can get so quickly ripped out. Over the years of my life in ministry, it's something that I've had to fight over and over again to maintain the integrity of the Scripture, that the Scripture would be central and not emotion and not feelings and not opinions and not public, you know, the current events. You don't hear me talking about all that stuff. It's the Scripture that's most important, and we've got to keep to that in our lives. Very good. So, um, back to Peter chapter 5. In verse 2 again, Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion. Let me just talk about that. Exercise oversight. The particular word that's used in the Greek makes me think of uh, well, first of all, it makes me think of Ezekiel chapter 33, I think it is. It's in your notes. Yeah, chapter 33 and chapter 3. You elders, I suggest you read those verses. They're very, they're very pointed and very important for us as elders to understand. But the other thing that I think of is that in, their, in, in ancient times, in their culture at that time, they had cities and they had walls around the cities and they would take turns watching over the city. Different families would be appointed at different times to watch over the city at night. What they would be watching for is the approaching of enemies. Uh, and, you know, that they would sound the horn and warn people were being attacked. Or they would also, they would be watching over so that there wouldn't be wolves and, and animals, wild an animals, to come in to kill some of the flock, the literal sheep that were outside the city gates. They would also be watching over so that there wouldn't be fires in the community or that there wouldn't be thieves going around. They were to be watchmen over. And that, that literal thing is taken in a metaphoric way as an elder. And again, we see this throughout the scriptures. We know from Ephesians chapter 3 that the devil throws fiery darts. We know from what we just read in, in Acts chapter 2 that there are wolves. And in Peter 5, there are lions. There are wild animals that will attack the flock. And then we know that there are thieves. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So the, this really is an apropos um, thing to be saying to the elders. Shepherd the flock, taking the oversight. Watch over doesn't mean controlling the people, but having a watchful eye over what's going on so that the devil doesn't mess with us or anybody else. By the way, uh, the church at Ephesus responded well to Paul's exhortation. We know from the book of Revelation that they did guard the, the doctrine, but unfortunately they lost something else that was very important, which was love. Uh, You've got to have both. In verse 2 again, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God. As elders, 
We're not to be doing this because we're under compulsion. We're not being coerced into it. We're not being manipulated into it. We're not doing it for, for a sordid game. We're not doing it for money. We're doing it out of a pure heart. Again, I think of, I think of David, where it says of him in Psalm 78, And Yahweh also chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds and from the, the care of ewes with, suck, with suckling lambs, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart. Elders want to be doing what they're doing in ministering to the people of God because they got a pure heart. A lot, of, a lot of times people get involved in, in service such as being an elder or a pastor, or for that matter, a doctor, a nurse, a counselor, a lot of people get involved in service-oriented things because they're missing something on their own, on the inside. And helping other people will fill that void for them. It's a wrong motivation. It's not the right motivation. It's a true thing that, that you'll feel better in helping other people. But the reason that an elder would want to minister to the people of God is not because it, it validates himself or herself. It's not because it makes them feel better although that is true, you will feel good in doing this. The reason for doing it is because you know that God loves you and you love Him. You're not serving because you're getting something. You're serving because you have been served and you want to give back. There's a pure, godly, love-motivated inspiration behind the service. That's true of all service in the church. We don't want to, you know, you have to mature into that. All of us want, you know, all of us are looking for a pat on the back at one point in our lives. But we want to mature to, to understand that our, our service among each other, the way of loving and helping each other, is because we know that God loves us and we love Him. And because of that, we want to love others. And, and when you have that maturity and that understanding, you're no longer, you're no longer uh, motivated by how people respond. You don't need to be validated by the people. You don't need the pat on the back. You, your, your life isn't going to be elevated because they appreciate it. It isn't going to be de-elevated because they don't appreciate it. How people respond to your love and your service really becomes irrelevant because your love and service to your fellow man is because of you know that God loves you and you love him. It's all about God and it's not about people. People are like the wind. One day they'll pat you on the back. The next day they'll kick you a little lower. You don't want to be motivated by people, but by love. And that's what this is saying. You know that the, you exercise the oversight not under compulsion, but voluntarily, not according according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain. Sordid gain. That word sordid isn't one. And ignoble actions and motives. You know, uh, moral, moral uh, distaste. You know, you're doing it for the wrong thing. Uh, you certainly, if, if, you're, if your motivation for helping others in the church is money, there's much better jobs that you can get to make a lot more money with a lot less headaches than being a pastor in the church or being an elder in the church. Take it from the, the voice of experience. You know, so, but uh, no, very seriously, there's no, the, the, we're told in the scriptures that it's, it is appropriate to, to support our people that are serving in the church. It does tell us that very clearly, but the, it's not talking to the people, it's talking to the elder. He's saying... God is saying to him or to her, you're not doing this for sordid gain. It's not the purpose. Not so you get a pat on the back, not so that you're making money, and so on. Although compensation is not the wrong thing to do. Verse 3 says, Not yet as lauding it over, not yet as lauding it over those who allot it to, <laughs> to their charge. I'm sorry, I just thought of something that was funny. What I was thinking of is um, uh, Julie's, not Julie, 
I called you Julie. Huh? No, I'm, I'm, I'm Nancy. Golly, I'm sorry. Nancy's got her her uh, grandsons with her, and these two twerps were messing around when we were singing. So it says, "Don't lord it over them." But I did go up to him. I said, "You two knuckleheads, cut it out. You do what your grandmother tells you." They sat still, right? So you can do that with kids, but you can't do that with adults. You can lord it over kids, and you better, or they'll lord it over you. But uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to elders dealing with the church, we don't lord it over people. God gave people free will, and we never violate people's free will. You just don't do that. You don't force people. You don't coerce people. You don't threaten people. You don't bully people. You love people. And what this says is, you do, you set an example. You set an example. Verse 3, not as lording it over those who are allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. That's the best way that we help each other, is by example. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. Now there's a reward, huh? When, when the chief shepherd appears and when Jesus comes back, those that give themselves in service to others in the church are going to be rewarded for that. That sounds pretty good to me. Now, you younger men, we're not, now we're not talking to the elders anymore. We're talking to you younger men. Let me see who those guys are. <laughs> you younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. Hmm, let's think about that. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and to all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I was so blessed to hear the prayers this morning. You talked about pride, and then one of you talked about humility. And uh, it was pretty neat to see how God set that all up. We, we, we're supposed to have humility. You know what humility is. Well, I don't care if you know. That's not humility. No. Humility is, is, you know, first of all, our humility is to the Lord God, right? And to our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What that means is it's, it's just this simple. You have the understanding you need help. And you're going to accept that help. You need God's help. God wants to help you. God is willing to help you. You got to let him help you. It's, it's humility. And um, I think when Jesus, when Jesus taught on the subject of humility, my favorite part, the, my favorite record of doing this, uh, Angela, he took a kid, your youngest kid. Well, I, maybe that's a little bit young, but, well, you know, a little baby, brought him before the people and said to them, you got to be like this if you want to enter into the kingdom of God. What does this mean? The kid's in diapers. He needs to be changed. She needs to be fed. She needs everything. She's totally dependent and that's what we're supposed to be in our relationship with God, that we're totally dependent on Him. <clears throat> but it's not, also it's not only talking about our relationship with God, it's talking about our relationship with each other. Again, look at verse 5 with me. For you younger men likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Look at Ephesians. Just go back a couple of books in the Bible there. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. It's a nice section of Scripture in verse 1. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We need each other. As we, we learned last week, we have, we, we, we're, we're to be a part of the community. We belong to a community where we, we, where we help each other. I need your input, you need my input, we need each other. Well, it doesn't work if I'm not humble to that reality. If I don't know that I need 
your help. I don't know that I need you, then I'll, I'll isolate. And a lot, of, a lot of people like to isolate, you know, that they, they want to be alone and um, by themselves. But the fact of the matter is, the way that God has instituted the church, he gives us the illustration of Christ as being the head and the people as being the body. And every member of the, of the, of the, of the body is as equally as important to every other member of the body because we all make up the whole. We all need each other. And, and so that's that humility piece. I can't live it on my own. I can't live in a cave, be a monk on my own, and think that it's the way that God designed for it to be. I need God's help in my life. I need the Lord Jesus' help in my life. I need your help in my life. Do you ever notice that you have a narrow mind? Oh, wait a minute. I didn't mean to say it like that. Well, we all do. You know, we, 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 we see life through, you know, whatever... We're like the horses, right? You know, we just see life, what's in our head. Well, it's not always right, what's in your head. There's, you know, there's other people that have other views. And, and when you listen to other people, you learn and you grow and you mature. Where if you just keep it to yourself, whatever you got is all you're going to get. You want to be open to other people and be receptive so that we can help each other to grow and to mature. Younger men, likewise, be subject to the elders, and all of you be clothed yourselves in humility towards one another. For God is opposed to the proud. Now, you really don't want God opposed to you. you. You got enough problems in life. I listed them earlier. You don't really want God opposed to you. Rather, you want him to be giving grace to the humble. One of my favorite verses in the Old Testament on humility is in Micah Chapter 6, verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does Yahweh require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Verse 6 says, chapter 5, verse 6, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you at proper time. Isn't that wonderful? Humble yourselves, and he will exalt you in proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And Jolene read this verse earlier when we took the offering. Casting all your cares, your anxieties on him because he cares for you. There, there, um, there are so many verses in the scriptures that talk about casting our cares on God. But I, I love the ones that are in Psalms. And I just put a few of them up here to bring to your remembrance. It says in Psalm 16, 8, I have set Yahweh continually before me. Because he is on my right hand, I will not be shaken. Because he's on my right hand. Trusting him. Put your anxieties on him. Be anxious for nothing, but everything by what? Prayer and supplications. Let your requests be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which passes understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You know, you trust in him and you will not be shaken. 21.7 For the king trusts in Yahweh. And, though, and through the loving kindness of the Most High... He will not be shaken. We don't need to be shaken, no matter what's coming up, if we have our trust and our commitment to Him. Wait on for Yahweh. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for Yahweh. Don't be anxious. Don't be uptight. Don't be quick. Slow down. Wait for Yahweh. 37.5 Commit your way to Yahweh. Trust also in Him. And he will do it. Trust him. He'll take care of you. 55.22 Cast your burden upon Yahweh and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be forsaken. 62.2 He, Yahweh alone, is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be greatly shaken. 62.8, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. 
So the point is, don't be anxious. Give it to God. Let God take care of your business. A week from this coming Tuesday, September 19th, we're going to begin an eight-week class called Communicating with God. There is no other book in the Bible that shares so effectively the ways to communicate with God as is so in the book of Psalms. It really sets forth for us how to communicate with Him. The Psalms illustrate by way of prayers and songs and just straight talk how to communicate with God, which is vital. And it, and, and it also covers every diverse kind of situation that you can imagine, from, from uh, David being at the point of death to David being at the point of jubilation and just thrilled with life. And everything there in between, and we see in these Psalms how to effectively communicate with God. We're told in the New Testament to pray, to sing, to praise in, our, in communicating with God, but there's very few illustrations on just exactly how to do that. There are some very great prayers written that we should emulate, that we should pray in Ephesians 1, Ephesians 3, and so on. But as far as how do you really communicate with God, it isn't laid out for us in the church epistles. It doesn't need to be. It was, the, you know, the, the foundation of it is in the Old Testament with the book of Psalms. It is extraordinary what's presented there. And uh, David... David is the writer. It's definitely that David is the writer of 75 Psalms, probably a lot more. The other men who wrote the Psalms were all under the supervision of David. He had appointed these men to be in charge of praising God. That was literally their job. They had the job to praise God. With David in the book of Psalms, we see how he changed the whole way that people worship God and how the people communicate with God. In the, uh, I, you know, I put a little chart here. In the, in the Old Testament, in the Torah, that's the first five books of the Bible, we're given, you know, they're given the old, the old law and how to deal with God, how to communicate with God. Look at this. It, it shows you in the Torah, the word song is used seven times. Just doing word study. In, in the book of Psalms, it's nine times. There's not much difference there. The word to sing is used only three times in those first books of the law. It's used 87 times in the book of Psalms. The word praise is used six times in those books and 166 times in the book of Psalms. The word thanks four times in Psalms 61 times. The word prayer zero times and in the book of Psalms 33 times. The book of Psalms changed the whole way that people related to God and how we should relate to Him now. In this, we'll learn how to effectively communicate with God in every situation in life. I'm really excited about this class. I think it's going to make a big difference in our lives. I, I invite you to participate in it. I, I, it is not my intent to just impart knowledge to you. It is my intent that God would work in your heart to change, to enhance your relationship with Him so that you can more effectively communicate with Him. Come join us this coming week from this Tuesday. If you don't live around here, you can do it on the uh, thing over there, <laughs> the website. Back to Peter. <laughs> In Peter chapter 5, how to get into all that? Verse 8, be sober. Hmm. Be sober spirit. Be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Be sober. Be sober minded. So many verses in the scriptures talk about being sober minded. Romans, Ephesians, Thessalonians. Be sober minded. How do you, how do you stay sober minded? You control your thoughts. You think the word, you pray, you, 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 you keep out those things that, that make your mind drunk or intoxicated. Keep your mind sober and be on alert because there is an adversary that walks around wanting to do, acting like that he doesn't exist or not acknowledging that he does exist is really not good. 
And then it says in verse 9, but resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Oh my God, I can't believe this is happening to me. How could this happen to me? Why is it always me? How come it always happens to me? Well, this says no. It happens to all of us. You're not alone. That's why we want to help each other, because you probably have already gone through this and have been successful, and you can help me to go through it. We've all, we all experience this suffering. Verse 10, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. What a wonderful verse. What a great promise. After you have suffered for a little while, this is what God's going to do for you. He'll do it for you today, and he'll certainly do it for you when the kingdom comes. When the kingdom comes, you will definitely be perfect and confirmed and strengthened and established. Everything's going to be good. And when you trust in God today, you cast all your cares upon him. When you resist the devil today, when you're sober-minded today, your life is so much better today. I can't imagine going through life without God. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. This catapults me back to chapter 1. If you wouldn't mind turning there. The way that this ends is talking about his dominion forever and ever and our being a part of that. It's very much the way that the epistle began in, in um, chapter 1 where it says, blessed be, where are we, Vince? Verse, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Well, that'd be a great name for a church. <laughs> caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. It's under the, the protection and the, the lockbox or the, the safe of God that this is all going to come. It's not, it, it cannot perish, it cannot be defiled, and it's not going to fade away. This inheritance is there for us in eternity. We, throughout the epistle, we have been reminded that Christ is coming back. And yes, there are times of suffering, there are difficult times, but Christ is coming back. This is but a moment of time. And that, that uh, Jolene shared that prayer, that uh, verse from Corinthians, that it's just, a, you know, it's just a, a slight thing in comparison to the glory that is to come. Christ is coming back. And, and nothing, nothing can impede the greatness of what's going to happen when he comes back. It's not imperishable. You can't screw it up. You can't foul it up. It doesn't say screw it up. It says you can't defile it, and it's not going to fade away. <laughs> so keep on living for that glorious day. And don't get sidetracked today. Stay on alert. Let God work with you. Go back to chapter 5 and... In verse 12, through Sylvanus, our faithful brother, well, verse 10, to him be dominion forever and ever, amen. Through Sylvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Now, Sylvanus is... Uh, his, his ancestors are the ones that invented TV. That was bad, wasn't it? Yeah. So um, he apparently is the one that wrote as Peter dictated. I have written to you briefly exhorting and testifying that the true grace of God stand firm in it. That's the way to understand the book of Peter. Stand firm firm in it. And by the way, she who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends greetings. And so does my son, Mark. 
Mark that would be probably referring to John Mark. John Mark was one of these younger men that Peter worked with. I'm sure John Mark showed humility. Peace to you who are in Christ. Now I'm going to close with a word of prayer. And I'm going to ask Donald and Peter to come back up and to close this um, service and this, and this uh, epistle with this great song, uh, It Is Well With My Soul. And uh, the reason I want to do that is because the man who wrote this was under tremendous suffering when he wrote it. And look what the reflection of his heart was in this song. You'll see it. Lord, we love you so much. We're so thankful to you for allowing us to, again, be a part of your family, for giving us very specific direction on how to live the right way, even though we have difficulties at times. Thank you for Jesus' influence upon us as our Lord, for the Holy Spirit that lives within us, for the Scripture, and for the family of God that we have each other to help. Thank you that no matter what, everything is well. It is all well with our soul. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
And Lord, haste the day.